curator and the canon, um, and has done a great work in terms of traveling all over the Middle East, Syria, um, Palestine, and many other countries. But um, Canon Desmond is also um, quite actively involved with the interfaith work, and we'll talk about this paper. Okay, Kieran. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, for uh, setting up this uh, meeting today, this conference of condolence, and also to Abdusam uh, Evan for his kind invitation uh, to me to be here and to commemorate with you uh, this uh, terrible event. Uh, I must say I feel rather humbled uh, this afternoon to be following such an array of uh, not only established speakers, but people, young people, who are so much in command of their English and of their Arabic and of their faith and the subject of that faith. It has been an inspiration uh, and <coughs> thanks to uh, the mosque here uh, to the whole educational program, and particularly to their fathers and mothers, and to the home life which they share, um, they are a credit to their families, and I have deeply enjoyed every moment of every address that has been given by the young people, such an example to us for the future. Without real empathy, Christian-Muslim dialogue remains a dialogue on the surface. A light encounter, as opposed to a rich, mutually shared experience, which can continue to inspire new avenues for exploration. So said Mona Siddiqui in her book, Christian Buzzle. I find remember uh, with Siraj and Abu Hassan of the Three Face Forum here in Dublin and in Ireland, that we have achieved something of the ideals and of the convictions of Imam Hussein. <coughs> Muharram, the very mention of which draws words in grief and marks a period of mourning and contemplation for Muslims throughout the world, is commemorated in this month. The skies wept and the earth kissed the severed head of Imam Hussein. At Karbala, and on those scorching sands, a man took his stand. We have been so graphically told. He took a stand against tyranny and injustice and the callousness of a regime whose premise was based on a violation of human rights, a regime whose very existence was against the very name of Islam, the democratic principles and the peace for which Islam and its followers stand for. And this man, we have been again so graphically told this afternoon, with a small band of 72 men, which included old men and youth and <coughs> children, ill-equipped and thirsty for three days, dared the might of a strong 22,000 troops. The grandson of the Prophet, Imam Hussein, was killed along with his companions. And what is an infamous event became a motive of resistance against tyranny and oppression in the Islamic world, instilling the sentiment of resistance amongst Muslims throughout centuries. But I believe that the message from Kabbalah is even more profound because the template is not merely one of tyranny and revolution, a fight to the last. We would misunderstand it if that is all we thought it was. Antoine Barra, the Lebanese writer, aptly described no battle in the modern and past history of humankind has earned more sympathy and admiration as well as provided more lessons than the martyrdom of Hussein 
in the Battle of Karbala. So consequently, like his grandfather, the Prophet Muhammad, had endeavoured earlier, Imam Hussein led by example, and his stand against Yasin needs to be contemplated more profoundly in today's time, when blood is shed in the name of religion, of culture, of ideology. And we who have lived in Ireland over the last 30 or 40 years know only too well the hatred and the tyranny and the killing and the sorrow that come about through the disastrous events that we have been part of in this country. In the Battle of Kabbalah, Hussein was not only accompanied by Muslims, but he was also accompanied by people of different faiths and ideologies who also gave their all for the cause of truth and justice. There were Christians there from the Middle East and from Africa. There were Hindus from India. And along with fellow Muslims, their lives were sacrificed. After the tragedy of Kabbalah, history is full of examples of Jews and Christians assisting the family of Hussein. And I want to draw something from that analogy later. Whilst the Prophet's grandson himself led by example, he didn't start the battle himself, and he offered dialogue to those with whom he differed. He ordered his troops not to attack those who ran away, those who were without weapons, and to show clemency. Today, 14 centuries later, the epoch-making <coughs> event of Kabbalah gives a message to our world. A lesson that differences, however big it might be, can be overlooked towards a better human condition. And we, as people of many nations here gathered this afternoon, of different religious affiliations, of different cultures and various ideologies, can join under a common flag for a cause, a cause that might eradicate poverty and corruption racial prejudice and all other ills that come across our that come across in our world and deprive humanity of peace. So misunderstandings need to be removed. Trust and respect between peoples established and in a sense a solidarity to be fostered that ensures world peace and cooperation. Many people of goodwill, of faith and of no faith have acknowledged this message. So Imam Hussein does not belong only to Muslims. He is a treasure common to all the creatures of Almighty God. And I congratulate the Muslims that among them there has been such a personality who is acknowledged and revered equally by all the communities of our world. <coughs> It was Jawahar Lal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, who acknowledged as much in these words. There is a universal appeal in this martyrdom. Imam Hussein sacrificed his all, but he refused to submit to a tyrannical government. He never gave any weight to the fact that his material force was far less in comparison to that of the enemy. The power of faith to him is the greatest force which regards all material force as nothing. This sacrifice is a beacon light of guidance for every community and every nation. Now, I remember um, <clears throat> at one of our meetings, uh, I'm not sure which imam it was, said that if I were to go back to my mosque or my Islamic center, and I were to say to my people, I was just come back from a meeting of Three Faith Forum where we were talking about faith that we hold in common. They would immediately turn to me and say, and what had you to talk about? Why were you there? 
we cannot uh, sacrifice, in a sense, the deeply held convictions into the family <coughs> in which we have been born. And I remember him saying uh, that whilst that was true, it was amazing how different interpretations of faith can reflect after listening to and talking with others about their faith. Because after all, this Abrahamic forum brought together Christians, Jews and Muslims, people of the book, people who have a definite line of antiquity and continuity through the pages of the book. And over those years, we have met and we have addressed many common problems. I think we would all agree that there are times when the media give negative images, debating what Muslim women should or should not wear, or describing Islam in terms of jihad and struggle. And this scrutiny can have a negative impact on an individual's identity formation. And young people are likely to suffer from a lack of confidence and self-esteem, finding it harder to feel accepted and part of a wider civil society. And I do feel strongly that Irish Muslims need to cultivate their own identity, be confident and secure, and know that the wider society of which you are a part in this country welcomes you, because you bring a tremendous depth of richness and diversity into the lives of those who might consider themselves to be at home in this place. There are two exemplary icons who gave us the lead and the way, both of whom sacrificed their lives for what they would believe to be the benefit of humankind. And they're found at the center of our Abrahamic faiths. Jesus, who is on the list of names there, who identifies himself with the experiences of the stranger and the outsider at the hands of those claiming to be disciples. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Lord, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? As you did it for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And Imam Hussein, grandson of a prophet, aptly described as the conscience of all religions, and whom today, joining together with Muslims throughout the world, we commemorate his memory, his example, and the inspiration he has given us. Thank you. The entire ethos of the message of Imam Hussein bringing back to the Dublin uh, an interfaith in the context of this interfaith dialogue that has been continuing since we started three faith. This movement of mine, Imam Hussain, quoting to Imam Hussain, um, he says that this movement of mine is not an account of subconsciousness, stubbornness, rebellion, worldly possessions, or instigation by Satan. It is also not my object to create trouble or to oppress anyone. The only thing which invites me to this great movement is that I should reform the affairs of the followers of my grandfathers. And this is the key fundamental aspect that he set out to reform the, the affairs of the followers of his grandfather. Eradicate corruption, undertake enjoining to do good and to restraining from evil. And this is the message, a very famous piece which has been repeated in Arabic and Urdu and in English and all that. This is the center aspect of Imam Hussain's movement. No other. And perhaps that is the reason that has lived on and has created the momentum throughout the globe uh, in such a powerful way. Kieran, if you're ready, then.
And I'd like to invite you. You have to set up the computer. You have to set up the computer. Okay, this computer is creating. Most of us are familiar, but not everybody is familiar with Ashura. Not everybody understands the background to Ashura and the background to Karbala. So I give a little history. And it's so beautiful here. Oftentimes people say in Islam there is no art. But we see here beautiful depictions of Imam Hussein and Imam Ali. Also in, in Iraq here, many different pictures, but this is just one of one of them. So this is the background to the Shia personalities and the events. So we know about the Hijra, and we know of the death of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Caliphate of Ali in 655, and then the assassination of Ali, and the martyrdom of Imam Hussein in 680. So that puts it into a context of when he was died and what the moment that he, his martyrdom had taken place, long after the death of his grandfather, and long after the assassination of his father. So that kind of gives us, a, we're talking about the seventh century, and then this is the kind of, for, for Christians in that sense, it is kind of the seventh century, and particularly 680 when it took place. And this is a picture of Iraq. And most of us are familiar, but not everybody is familiar. See Kerbala right on the bank of the Euphrates River, north of Najaf, and north of Nasriya and Basra. And they are right on the bank of the Euphrates, so important that it took place there on that particular river when they came to stop and made their camp, and which is remembered during Ashura and during Muharram. We see now how popular Ashura has begun and how many people come to Iraq every year and come to Karbala every year during Ashura and take part. Over four million people gathered, probably one of the largest meeting of humanity in the world now. Even more than Hajj, when we think of the whole of Muharram and people gathering right throughout Arbaim, it continues a whole movement of people of many hundreds of thousands of people gathering at the Mount Hussein Shrine on the eve of Ashura. And here we see all that's associated with them, the banners and the music and the marching and the parade and all that takes place around it at, at the Shura in, in Iraq. And this is inside the shrine, just at, 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 just at, at the very the picture. And it was a beautiful experience just to move inside the shrine and to be able to, as a Christian, to be welcomed into the shrine and to meet people there and to take part in the It's a tremendous consolation to cry and to feel the grief of the family of Hussein and to remember the death and the martyrdom of all the members of his family and to relive that and to remember that. And it's, it's, it's as if it's almost present again. And this story has embedded into our consciousness and it's become a very real program for people every year and it nourishes the faith of Shia all across the world as they remember this tragic event and touch into their own sense of loss. And one thing that I would say, many Shia have encountered great difficulty in their own life and particularly Iraqis have suffered the death of their brothers and sisters and many have suffered the death of terror terrorism and different attacks and so it's very important to have this cathartic moment in the year to cry and to remember with grief the death of Imam Hussein but we're also remembering our own grief the death of our own loved ones those who lost their lives through violence throughout the year and people gather across the world also in the UK and they remember with great affection and they feel deeply the loss of Imam Hussein as they feel deeply the loss of their own relatives and experiencing their own grief and their own, their own loss and their own tragedy in their own lives. And this is the northern part and part with as well, the, 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 where people will see it. This, this one is taking place in Iraq as well. But there are other forms of this Batam that have taken place right across the different across the world. And you know, people are very familiar with the beautiful songs that are a part of the, uh, the, the nights and the remembering and gathering together. O bear of the battle standard, O Hussein, son of Ali, O Ali, Kerbal, la ilah, ilah, Allah. Karbala, no God is their save God, and the meaning of Karbala, and when people gather together, these chants have become written down, and people remember them and memorize them, and they continue to recall the story of Muharram, and they continue to call, recall the story of Ashura. Every night, people remember the death and the martyrdom of Imam Ali and Imam Hussein and all his brothers and his family and his wife and his children <coughs> were associated with it as well. This revolution that has taken place not only in Iraq but also in Iran for, that has been taking place for many years has 
has been motivated and has been inspired by the life of Imam Hussein and by his particular commitment not only to religious ideals but also to political ideals and to serving that. And we see so many people here exercising freedom in Iraq now uh, the first time, particularly in the south, in the Shia areas, where before it wasn't possible to celebrate uh, Shura and Muharram during the time of Saddam. And now people are free to do that and they're free to express them and they are free to curse their own government if they want to. Before you can't curse Saddam or else maybe you will end up in prison. But now, so this movement of religious freedom and democratic freedom has been taking place in Iraq, even though it was at a very big <coughs> price and it came at the cost of uh, occupation on the American and occupation, it became, but yet it was the first movement towards democracy that had taken place in that part of the world. So in a sense, this is where the Arab Spring began, and this is where the commitment towards democracy began in the Middle East. It began in the future, uh, maybe the leadership within the Shia community will continue to direct towards greater tolerance and greater peace, and our hope and our belief is that there will be a genuine, transparent, inclusive democracy in Iraq and in the Middle East. So the Arab Spring, which had its roots in Karbala and had its fruits in Iran and had its fruits in Iraq, is gradually taking place. And with Sistani and with people that, all, that are taking in all the Sadr community that is taking place, we believe that in fact democracy will really take root in the Middle East and will spread right across. And the time for tyranny and the time for dictatorship is over. So we see here a kind of this, I like this picture, just stepping out, somebody looking out uh, behind the Imam Ali and, Musa, and then trying to, uh, Muqtad al-Sadr in the background looking on, but at the same time, the people beginning tentatively into a new future. So it isn't a future only for Iraq, but it is a future that is important for the whole of the Middle East, right across Syria, Bahrain, Lebanon, right across the whole country, all of, all of the countries that are taking place, Saudi Arabia and all of the other countries, there's a real revolution is taking place that is bringing around more freedom in democracy, more participation in democracy, more transparency in government, no to dictatorship, no to tyranny, no to violence, and an opening up of political participation and opening up of kind of freedom for all people. So this is something that we need to be very proud of within the Shia community when people think of it, that this commitment towards democracy is not something that began with the Arab Spring, but it's something that has been there from the very heart of Islam, and at the very start of Islam, is taking place right with the Imam Hussein. To both the terror of the war and the still some of the backgrounds that are taking place. And George W. Bush, I don't know who will write the history of George W. Bush in Iraq, whether it, what, it will take many years before people start to understand what really happened and what, whether it was a, a blessing or a curse, or whether in fact it has opened things up. But at least with the with government, things are taking place. So thank you very much, and at least so the Arab Spring is alive and well in Iraq and in Iran, and it has its heart in the Shia community, So and it has its heart with the man who saves. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Kieran, for giving an overall um, history of current political movement in, in, the, in the light of the man who saves and linking back to it. And of course, your visit all the way to Najaf and Karbala.